to the first item for this afternoon, a statement from Council and Commission on Counter-Terrorism following the recent terrorist attacks. I will give the floor first to the President in Council, Mrs. Hennis Plashart, please. Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. President. President, Honourable Members, Mr. President, a European response is required to the horrific terrorist attacks we witnessed in Brussels on March 22. Our citizens are right to expect concrete action to counter terrorism, both from the governments and from the EU. Now, obviously, we, sh we share your strong will to fight terrorism, as was expressed by your representative, Zavik Kayom, on March 24. She said, Europe will not bow to terrorism. Our unity and determination to uphold our values and rights are only made stronger. Action must cover every aspect of the threat, from prevention to protection and prosecution. And right, she is. So yes, the EU must build a coherent internal security policy that delivers results and protects human rights. As co-legislator, Parliament has a key role to play in this. For example, strengthening in strengthening external border controls, and clearly cooperation on security and information sharing is key to maintain the freedom of movement without internal border controls. And all of us will have to understand that our internal and external security are closely interwoven. In other words, internal and external security can no longer be kept separate. An integrated approach is needed. Now, to give you a brief update of events, immediately after the attacks in Brussels, we convened the Justice and Home Affairs Ministers for a meeting on March 24. Vice President Zylvie Coyom was also present, together with representatives from Europol, Eurojust, the Schengen Associated Countries and Interpol. The Belgian ministers briefed their colleagues about the attacks. Ministers, in a joint statement, condemned the attacks and extended our sympathy to the victims and their families and our support and solidarity to Belgium. They also set out a number of priority areas for action, building on the efforts which are already underway. We do not start from scratch. Unfortunately, terrorism has been on the agenda for years. And at the very forefront since the terrorist attacks in Paris in January 2015. Priorities have been agreed and considerable progress has been made towards implementation, as set out by the EU counter-terrorism coordinator in his latest report of March 2016. But more needs to be done. The minister's statement once again underlined the urgent need to increase the systematic feeding in a qualitative and quantitative sense as well as consistent usage of our different databases and their interoperability. We need to make optimal use of the tools we already have. Firstly, maximum feeding and use of the databases by Member States is crucial. In particular, the SIS2 and Focal Point Traveller at Europol. The Presidency is undertaking work to improve the use of the SIS2 with the objective to agree on a number of actions at the GHA Council in June. Secondly, as of, first, as of January 1st this year, the European Counterterrorism Centre at Europol, the EZTC, is operational. The EZTC has been asked by France and Belgium to support the investigations after the no November Paris attacks and the Brussels attacks, which Europol is doing discovering links across the EU, not only information collection and sharing, but also, the, uh, but also the analysis. Therefore, at the extraordinary meeting on March 24, ministers decided to, to set up a joint liaison team of national counter-terrorism experts to support the Member States law enforcement authorities in investigating the wider European and international dimensions of the cur current terrorist threat. Now, thirdly, special attention will be given to the Commission communication on smart borders and interoperability, which was issued last week. Improving interoperability of the EU's information system is a priority for the Presidency. It is important that customs, police and law enforcement officials can quickly and effectively consult our common databases. Privacy by design will obviously play a key role moving forward on this and, yes, 
parliament's role will be important once again. The presidency wants ambitious results in June. Counterterrorism has been added to the agenda of the Justice and Home Affairs Council in April. The roadmap with concrete deliverables on interoperability of databases and information sharing and better use of information systems will be prepared for the June Council meeting. And there is more that we can do. Together, we need to speed up the negotiation of pending legislation. I refer in particular to the Firearms Directive and the Terrorism Directive, as well as the targeted amendments to the Schengen Borders Code about systematic controls of EU citizens at EU external borders. As the statement of March 24 points out, we need preventive measures as well as repressive measures to effectively counter terrorism, which is why it is also important to progress on prevention of radicalization. As you know, the Radicalization Awareness Network and its working groups are actively sharing experiences and best practices. <coughs> now, the Internet Referral Unit at Europol is developing full operational capacity in 2016 and has already made significant headway in cooperation with Internet companies to remove online terrorist material. We know, we know there is a strong political will in Parliament to make progress on counter-terrorism measures. And we share this determination and we look forward to working with you in order to advance as quickly and effectively as possible. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Madam Minister. Now, on behalf of the European Commission, President Juncker. President in Council, President, um, Mr. President of the European Parliament, Madam President and Office of Council, ladies and gentlemen, the terrorists do not respect borders. Once they are in Europe, they can strike either in or outside of Europe and they are attacking our way of life and the ensemble of our values. The, on the 22nd of March they struck in Belgium, in Brussels, a city which is dear to us, which we love, full of our friendships and our amours, the, the place where we uh, live in harmony with um, our neighbours. And the Commission is in mourning, because in those cowardly attacks we lost Patrizia Rizzo, a young Italian woman, full of energy, intelligent, smart, radiant, and she will be fresh in our memories for a very long time. Let me pay tribute here to each and every one of the victims. Let us have a thought for each of them, for each of those lives uh, brought short. Thank, and thanks to everyone who was um, injured and let's um, wish all the best in, uh, to their, their family and friends. Can I salute the daily work of all of those thanks to whom we were able to resume the normal course of our activities in a sense, in a feeling of security, feeling safe and may continue use of our freedoms, particularly that of uh, moving around and travelling. It is incumbent on all of us to make available all the necessary tools and instruments to ensure that everyone is able to go about their business and do their jobs. That's what the Commission has been working on for many months now, to improve um, checks on air passengers, checks at the external borders, police and judicial cooperation between member states and while remembering the essential cooperation between the secret services and the intelligent community. It is essential um, that we increase, uh, raise our game in terms of exchanging information as well. Cooperation is strength. Only last week the Commission brought forward a new proposal on the subject, in particular the way in which um, the present and future information systems can, be Im Im can improve the management of external frontiers and thereby uh, reinforce internal security in Europe. We need to be aware that even as we speak, there are certain information systems at EU level uh, which provide uh, the bodyguards and the police forces 
pertinent information about the movement of persons. But as too often, when security matters are at stake, the problem is not so much a lack of instruments, but the failure to use existing uh, tools and instruments and a deficiency on the cooperation side. Information is there, uh, but it can drift into the sand all too often or arrives at its destination too late. Therefore, we must have more interconnection and greater interoperability. The truth is, however, that whatever the quality of the legislative work of the Commission and whatever the backing and support of the European Parliament, whatever the sophistication of the systems which we deploy, terrorism in Europe is not anti-terrorism will not be effective until and such time as the Member States are prepared to cooperate with each other more and with the European agencies, in particular Europol. And this is why, when we talk about combating terrorism, we must recognise no one can uh, sermonise anyone, no one can give lessons and lecture anyone, and certainly not Belgium. Bel we cannot lecture Belgium. It's a great country which has been sorely uh, tried. And no finger pointing at Belgium, please. Let us not forget, this is not the first time that uh, indiscriminate terrorism has struck in the heart of Europe. And if there is a failure, it's a collective failure, first and foremost, because for decades now, we have been able to draw lessons from such attacks. I remember European councils in 1999 and then in 2001, or with my good friend Guy Verhofstadt and others, where we swore that we would have a proper exchange of information between um, information services. And now is the time for action in the field of security and indeed in many other um, areas. It's fragmentation which renders us um, vulnerable and Europe needs a, a proper security union. And I'm counting on the backing of this parliament to bring to fruition all of the proposals which the Commission has brought forward and which can be the harbingers, the precursors of that uh, security union, which I uh, hope that we will see materialise. As one thinks back to the attacks in, in Paris, thereafter the Commission brought forward legislative and non-legislative measures in a package um, concerning firearms. And it took six days, six days for the Commission to drop those proposals. Now, six months, six months later, I cannot yet see. Uh, it's important that we move towards adoption thereof. And the Commission it continues to work away, even if we are not seeing forward movement there. And we will do so in the next few weeks to make sure that we can advance our security agenda. And we will give an ambitious road um, map with, con with um, its content and a timetable for implementation. The Commission will be counting on the cooperation of the European Parliament and of Council, because we are talking here about the security and the liberties of our citizens, which is, um, above all else, a common obligation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, President of the Commission. I now give the floor, on behalf of the EPP, to Mr. Weber. Honourable President, um, President in Office, President of the Commission, I'm very grateful to Mr. Juncker for making it clear to us what we're talking about today. We're talking about the 37-year-old mother who, who leaves children behind, twins behind. She was killed at the airport, and the people who loved uh, Brussels and died in the metro and the young teacher, Muslim teacher, who was on her way to school in that metro. Three uh, cases, three innocent victims and uh, that happened to us in our European city. And what we need to do in view of the EPP is to prevent this. But we also needed to say thank you to the firefighters who come uh, to the place immediately after. They don't know whether there's still danger, but nevertheless, they assist. The people who uh, spend hours over time to help people, the policemen and the soldiers who 
came uh, from in Brussels, in Brussels and in Strasbourg to make sure that we are safe. I would like to thank everybody who defends and protects Europe. And the, then I would like to talk about uh, the question of our responsibility, because when we look at legislation, we must see whether we do enough. Colleagues, no, it is not enough what we're doing. More security means more cooperation within Europe. And the Commission and Commissioner Van Rovopoulos uh, have therefore can be assured that they are, have the support of the EPP when you're talking about the new European Security Agency. We need to prevent all the secrecy in, uh, of member states. That must reach an end. And the uh, in ministers of the interior are the ones responsible for making sure that everything is kept so underhand. And for months we've been asking for uh, information about passengers on aeroplanes and now we see after a lot of hard work on Thursday we are actually going to talk about the PNR. It's something that's important for us to know and we, it's interesting to know who regularly visits Syria or Afghanistan and we need that information, that data. Uh, colleagues, we need more. We have an agreement with the Americans on the evaluation of financial flows, the T T FTP, the T and the banks that uh, look at the finance of terror. Why are we not doing this? Why are not we not in a position to find our own data, to evaluate that data and find out how terror is financed? We don't have that uh, possibility in Europe, but there we have the Americans working on our behalf but we need to have standards in Europe that we can uh, be responsible for ourselves. Europol, uh, we don't see that people are volunteering when we're uh, collecting information, but Europol must be entitled to demand information from member states, and this information should not just be provided voluntarily. And finally, colleagues, the Internet. It has lost its innocence. In the Internet, we see hatred, we see uh, new terrorists being acquired by the Internet, we have agitation against our principles, and therefore the Internet is now obliged to make sure that there are rules applying to what we do on the Internet, and we need a structure that makes it clear, and we need a sort of an, a network uh, authority that makes it clear what goes on there. We need a security agency, and the Commission will certainly get the support of the EPP. And finally, I would like to express my thanks, because when what we can say is that the terrorists basically want our way of living, freedom, uh, the, will, the way we live and so on, and therefore we, what we come up against is hatred. What we must do is get to counter terrorism and sickly to live the way we have always done, to continue the way we think is right. Thank you very much. Mr. Albrecht has a question for you. Thank you, Mr. Weber. I've got great respect for what you say, and I agree with much of your remarks. But two questions. You say that for the investigative authorities, it's important um, to, to know who is coming into Europe. And we, we know how many, we know that, that demand for where seat placements on aeroplanes is what is always called for when it comes to the standards for the storage of that information that is not some add-on extra it's essential for democracy is that not just as important Honestly, I am speechless we have a debate as Europeans here and we have faced and uh, uh, challenged by terror and then I am really amazed about the questions that are asked. We do want data protection and the PNR uh, and other regulations. We do see the, uh, high, very high levels of data protection. We're not going the way of the Americans when we're talking about combating terrorism. We have our own solution. But in today's world we can see in Google and Facebook every single day that data are powerful tools. 
and that's why for we must have legal rights to f for authorities to have access to the information. That's why we need PNR, and I'm very grateful for the uh, question because we can hear who is re actually refusing to provide this data that our authorities need. That's what that is. And the next speaker. On behalf of the ESD, Mr. Pitella. Thank you, President. Over the last year, sadly, on all too many occasions, this House has found itself having to debate terrorism. Of course, there's a risk of disillusionment, but we can't allow ourselves to get used to terrorism. But did Chiarizzo and so many others have lost their lives? Life is sacred. And it's the basis for modern society. I'm, I'm saying this that because if we're to fight terrorism, first and foremost, we have to ask ourselves how it's possible that our children can have denied the very heart of our civilization. I know this is... A, a delicate argument behind this ideology of of death we, we shouldn't be looking for Islam rather than looking into radical Islam we should be pondering on the phenomenon of the radicalization of Islam Islam itself is a religion of peace this ideology is based rather on a desperate type of radicalism it's the children are the phenomenon of people around the world losing their roots rather than having anything to do with Islam. It's to do with the widespread failure of multiculturalism. Under the label of multiculturalism, very often people take a community approach. In other words, there's a concept that men and women from different origins cannot live together but need to separate themselves out into distinct social groups. We have to tackle that. The first way we should respond to these attacks is to look at what unites us and assert a citizenship which entails rights but also values and duties that we all share. That line of thinking must be accompanied by urgent action. First and foremost, the national governments must wield the existing instruments, such as DNA data exchange, fingerprint uh, data exchanges. In fighting terrorism, our main weapons are intelligence and in, uh, investigation. Now, Europe, sadly, is lagging behind uh, on that front. But the terrorists are united, and we're responding to them in divided ranks. We need to rely on European intelligence, not an unteam type of coordination, but a real network of information with a European counter-terrorism public prosecutor able to, to fight terrorism right across Europe. And we have to be uh, determined also in our foreign policy. I'm watching very closely what Federica Mogherini is doing. We need to, to be serene. ISIS is there because it's part of a cynical game of regional interests. If we're to fight ISIS, we need to start by fighting those who are buying oil from ISIS which it acquires in the areas it has taken over. We cannot have people in the West attacking ISIS on the one hand while at the same time doing business with those who are funding it. None of us has a magic wand to uh, do away with terrorism, but we, we can all be cohesive and work together in humility and unity. Thank you. On behalf of the ECR, Mr. Colonel has a question for you. He's speaking. Sorry. Interpreter's mistake. 
sorry, apparently I was told that I had a question for you. <laughs> um, it's rather sad that it's often moments like this that uh, is when we as a chamber come together and we all come together to condemn the acts that we have seen over the last few months and in fact years in many of our countries. But after each attack we have questions. And a few days after the Brussels attacks a man in my constituency tweeted how he had confronted a Muslim woman in Croydon in South London and asked her, quote, to explain Brussels, unquote. His tweet upset a lot of people. Another Twitter user replied, what has a Muslim woman in Croydon in South London got to do with the horrific events in Belgium? So while his original tweet may have been offensive or clumsy, it also demonstrates that we are all looking for answers, whether we are of no faith, another faith, or are Muslims. We all want to explain Brussels, a city we know so well, whose citizens have buried family, colleagues and friends prematurely after these appalling acts. Last month, I opened a conference in the European Parliament organised by the Iran Foundation on tackling extremism and terrorism. And what was interesting about this conference was while there may be people in this chamber who call for more European agencies to solve all these problems, None of the speakers or the experts present claimed that there was a single solution or metaphorical silver bullet. Instead, they spoke about the need to tackle terrorism at various levels. At an international level, militarily, use of intelligence and diplomacy. At a national level, upholding the rule of law, defence of our values and security of our citizens. As well as at a local community level, to tackle extremism at its roots. And we spoke about the drivers of terrorism. Some searching for an identity or a sense of belonging others radicalised in prisons, some violent individuals looking for a new cause, others with grievances over perceived unfair foreign policy, yet more others vulnerable and fooled into believing that it was a violent shortcut to paradise in a world of temptation. And while we debate these issues here today, are we really clear about what we as MEPs can do to tackle this issue? Yes, we can vote for a new PNR system that takes account of concerns over data protection and civil liberties. Yes, we could encourage our intelligence agencies to work together. But this will only happen if they can trust each other to feel confident enough to share information, not if you force them. But for those of us who represent constituencies where young people have been radicalised, allow me to suggest one more thing we can do. At the Iman conference last month, I invited the Unity of Faith Foundation or TUFFFC, Tough FC Project, from London to speak about how they harness the power of football to give a sense of team spirit and instill British values to youngsters from different religions. At the project, I had met a young lady who told me how she almost went to Syria after being recruited via social media such as Snapchat. The project's founder, when he found out about this, made a few phone calls and gave her the choice of going through the gate of the airport to Syria or the gates of the stadium of the Premier League team that she supported. And when she arrived at the stadium, she was so overcome that she knelt down to kiss the pitch and now through her experience, encourages others not to be recruited in terrorism. Think of how much death and destruction that one act could have prevented. And as the project's founder said, one of the best ways to counter terrorism is to prevent people from becoming terrorists. There must be similar projects in many of our cities that we can support and encourage. And if not, let me know, since Tuff is willing to come to your town or city to help set up a similar project. So whilst we may not be able to explain Brussels, we may be able to help stop more attacks by encouraging cooperation across intelligence and security services, by giving security and law enforcement agencies whatever tools we can in a free and open society, and by supporting projects that stop young people becoming terrorists, and by all of us saying, that we will not treat all Muslims with suspicion. We will not drive more people into the arms of extremists. We will not let the terrorists win. Thank you, Mr. Kamal. Uh, Mr. Frunzulika wants to ask a question. Uh, Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. President. Last year in Paris, Mr. Kamal, a young Romanian couple were shot dead sitting at a table, you know, at a terrace in Paris. Afterwards, you know, the European Union set up a center to counter terrorism in, with Europol in Hague. 
45, 50 people. It's a small measure, you know, to counter terrorism. Don't you think so that the European Union needs a real agency to counter terrorism with a special intelligence service to counter terrorism, with special anti-terrorism troops to be pulled together by the member states finally to fight this uh, uh, terrible uh, situation? Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Kamal. Well, thank you very much for your question, but actually the answer is no. What we need is better share of intelligence. And when you speak to intelligence exp experts, they say actually, and when they're in their candid moments, they do not have confidence in the intelligence services in other countries. How do we make sure we build that trust so that, that intelligence can be shared? And let us get away from whatever the problem, the solution is more Europe and more agencies. Actually, if we sit in these agent, European agencies, we will ignore the young people in many of our communities who have been radicalised at grassroots level. For far too long we are ignoring this because we want to make grand speeches in this chamber about European solutions. What we have to avoid is to, what we can do is encourage these, these organisations to learn from each other Ilanka. and come together. But what we can't do is use it as an excuse for yet, yet more meetings in Brussels. Thank you now for the Liberal Group. Mr. Verhofstadt. Well, first thing what I want to do is to thank Jean-Claude Juncker for his words to uh, my country, to Belgium. Uh, and also um, I agree with him that uh, what we have not to do now is to repeat the ritual of, of speaking strong words and solemn declarations that the moment is there now to act and, and, and to do a number of changes. And I agree full, fully with you, and that's the opposite of what Mr. Kamal is saying, is the fragmentation who is the problem in Europe. And uh, say everything, yeah, our uh, intelligence service and police service have to work better with each other. Well, I can tell you we hear that already decades, uh, Mr. Kamal. Uh, this so-called recipe. It's not the recipe. We need European capacities. And that's also the lesson from history. What did the Americans, the Federal Bureau of Investigation was created in 1901 after a terrorist attack where the McKinley, the president at that moment of the US, was killed. And then they decided to do so. And in Germany, exactly the same story. The Bundeskriminalamt was upgraded and was really created as a federal agency after the Rote Armee Fraktion terrorist attacks. That was their lesson from history. And it's time, Mr. Kamal, that your group is also taking that lesson, that we create European capacities and European capabilities to solve the problem. Because, let's be honest, let's face the reality. I have here the long list of all terrorist attacks of the last year. In Madrid, they were known by the French and the British police. In London, they were followed and even partially arrested by the French police. The London attackers, the attackers who did the London bombing. In the attack in the Jewish Museum in Brussels was a French terrorist who was known by the French authorities and even by the German intelligence service. In Charlie Hebdo, the same story. They were known by the British authority before the attacks. The same with Abdes Salam, who was not stopped at this roadblock in Cambrai because the French didn't have it in their files, while the Belgians know very well who was Abdes Salam. And the same with uh, what the Germans did a few weeks before uh, the attacks in Paris. They found weapons and they didn't inform their French colleagues at that moment. The same now again in the attacks in Brussels, where apparently the Swedish had information and have not sent that to the Belgian authorities. How many attacks, Mr. Kamal, are there still needed before everybody understands that we need, on the European level, a real investigation capacity uh, as fast as possible? And let's, let's, let's face it. Let's face the reality. We have the possibility to do so. Terrorists don't know borders, it's only our police services and our intelligence service who know borders. And we have a possibility. We have the possibility now to change that, to build that up, Mr. Avramopoulos, because we have the file on Europol. We have finished the second reading. My proposal is to use this second reading between Parliament and Council to do a few amendments, not to, to 
delay it again by the end of the year, but immediately in the coming weeks. And I think to three changes that can be done. First of all, changing the regulation of Europol in Article 1 and 3 and to give them the possibility for an investigation capacity and not only coordination. First proposal. My second proposal is that in Article 6 of the regulation, we give finally to Europol the possibility to launch an investigation or to oblige national authorities to do so. They don't have even that possibility today. And then, and then finally, maybe the most important problem, Article 7 of the regulation, Mr. Avramopoulos, today is that the national authorities of Europol have to filter the information towards Europol. I thought it was the opposite what they have to do. That is to transfer the relevant data to Europol. So my proposal is that instead now of talking again about coordination, coordination, cooperation, cooperation, I have enough of these words that we build up and that we use the Europol file uh, 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 to, uh, to put that in place. And also to change naturally the role of the European prosecutor. Because the European prosecutor cannot only be responsible for financial fraud. We need to change also that so that the prosecutor is responsible also for transnational crimes like, for example, terrorism. So that's my proposal. Instead now of in the coming weeks fixing a little bit an old file of Europol, to use it in the coming weeks to make a leap forward and to do what the Americans have already done 115 years ago. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Albrecht, wants to ask a question. Mr. Verhofstadt. Thank you, President. This will be my last um, question this afternoon. Um, and I hope that you're not insulted by my request for information. There was a, you said that yet again, Brussels, Copenhagen, Paris, recent attacks, it, the perpetrators were were known to the authorities, and yet you stand up here for no, re no, no reason storage of data of um, air passengers, which is not going to solve that problem, and which is actually going to mean it's going to bind, tie down hundreds of millions of euros, which we need to invest in an efficient uh, Europol and um, effective uh, joint investigation teams. Thank you. I, I think, uh, uh, Mr. President, that all storage of data can be useful. Also, passenger name records, at the condition that there is also the capacity to analyze it, to transfer it from one authority to the other, that there are not walls be between the different databases. And that is the reason why I'm proposing this European capacity for intelligence and this European capacity for investigation. I think that besides the fact that we're going to create 28 databases, it's also necessary that the Commission come the fastest as possible forward with a horizontal system of mandatory sharing yeah. of information without what it is in fact not a useful tool otherwise. Dank, and that's also an initiative that I'm asking from the Commission. Dank, Thank you, Mr. Verhofstadt. I would remind um, colleagues that we have other two, uh, two other debates coming up, and we'll be able to go into these matters in detail there. For the GUE group, Mr. Silikiotis. Uh, Thank you very much, Mr. President. First of all, can I, on behalf of the GUE NGL group, repeat our um, dismay at the recent attacks in Brussels? Our thoughts are with the victims and uh, their families, and our condolences go to all the, the French, the Belgian peoples, and all the EU uh, nations and peoples who have suffered um, from attacks, uh, who have paid a heavy price in, uh, in blood in this Europe of, of ours. But it also applies to elsewhere, Tunisia, uh, Syria, um, Libya, um, India, other places as well in the wider world have been the um, locus of similar terrorist attacks. And the basic problem is the injustice in the distribution of wealth. That is at the root of this. And the European Union is not entirely without blame here. We have seen examples of EU member states slavishly following 
the United States of America. Uh, we have seen support going to extreme um, is Islamic groups and also to uh, ISIS. The European countries must not, we've got a historic uh, obligation to refrain from giving in and succumbing to an anti, um, anti-Islamism. It's accepted, we cannot uh, simply accept this, these attacks being used as a guise for imposing new uh, draconian measures which will further re restrict and curtail, curtail people's freedoms. The most effective way of tackling the dark forces of terrorism is waging war on injustice and inequality and also putting an end to invasions and aggression uh, which provides a seedbed for tourism. I believe that recent events have shown the bankruptcy of our policies uh, both within our frontiers and uh, beyond. And combating terrorism is not going to be done by simply in introducing more measures. It's making sure that we can create the basis for social growth and unemployment in the future. That's the, the best way. Thank you very much. Next for the Greens, Mr. Lamberts. Thank you, President. Colleagues, we cannot help but be disgusted to see the waste of human life as a result of these terrorist attacks planned in cold blood. We all stand by the victims and their families and loved ones. But how can you not be alarmed by the way that these things can go on in the midst of normal life. And how can we not be uh, outraged, given that measures have been planned for, for years, as mentioned by Mr. Verhofstadt, and d despite that these terrorists were allowed to move freely? How can we not feel scandalized by the fact that our countries are continuing to trade with Middle Eastern countries, promoting the most violent and ex extremist uh, forms of Islam? Surely we have to ask ourselves about what's been going on in our society which has pr promoted hate speech and um, people condoning violence. The ideology of, of exclusion, reduction of society to mere production and consumption. Now if we respond by setting up police states, constantly monitoring our slightest moves and stigmatizing our fellow citizens of uh, Muslim faith even more, uh, adopting uh, a rhetoric of, of warfare, dividing the world between them and us. If we do all that, then the terrorists will have won. On the contrary, the best response we can uh, give them is to reflect the mottos of Belgium and Europe. Unity in diversity uh, gives you strength. Let's pool our st strength in an intelligent way to fight their murderous projects. And above all, let's ensure that at the, the heart of our social projects, we restore human dignity of every individual to its proper place. Lastly, with your indulgence, Mr. President, I would, I would like to uh, qu quote François Bernardini briefly. Excuse nothing, forget nothing, resist, try and understand, because otherwise you will maintain evil. You can't fight shadows with shadows. You can't fight hatred with hatred. Eye for an eye will lead to our whole planet being blind. We have 130 reasons to uh, fight. We have another 32 reasons uh, after what happened in Brussels to believe in this cause and to wage it. Thank you. Herr Skiliotis, ich hatte eben eine Frage der Frau. I have a question from Mrs. Humanis. I had overlooked it, but I hope that we can still have time for it. You have the floor, madam. Yes, Mr. Silikiotis, I seem to gather from what you were saying that you were uh, acknowledging some sort of mea culpa for the uh, attacks. Are you saying that it's our fault that they're killing us? Mr. Silikiotis. First of all, let us not forget that uh, terrorism promotes certain ideas. And what I was saying 
uh, earlier on is that ISIS and other extremist Islamic, Islamist uh, bodies have had support from the Western countries, big countries, both economically, strategically and politically. And even today, uh, there are countries which are our allies, um, such as Saudi Arabia and Turkey. They are also providing uh, support. And the European Union is also involved in this and must share, uh, show there is part of the blame. Thank you. Thank you very much. For the EFTD group, Dan James. The fundamental EU principle of freedom of movement, people, services or goods may well have been well intentioned, but it can only remain so if it is reactive and updated, ideally, ideally integrating and responding to both external and internal threats and pleasures, pressures. Its fundamental weaknesses lie in the turgid, lengthy and often outdated processes required to address what are now fast-moving events, not merely on a European continent, but also on a global scale. But more fundamentally, on the sacrosanct protection that it enjoys in the face of fundamental threats to civic society and citizens. Trying to connect 28 member states, varied cultures and processes at a time of crisis, the EU is unable to anticipate events or be able to react at adequate speed to these events. Now, this is not an approach capable of countering or, be, or indeed beating terrorism. Where the, when there is a threat, it's important to think like the adversary, not bury oneself in mindless dialogue and consultation with the objective of protecting a sacred cow. Now, the United Kingdom endured some 30 years of conflict and terrorist activities before a resolution in Northern Ireland was found. The UK has much to offer the European and international community on how to counter terrorism, not least money laundering, a key element in terrorist funding and financing. But in contrast, the EU seems purely focused on unified border control and a central intelligence agency. But these so far have been total failures, critical weaknesses only serving to facilitate the recent terrorist atrocities. Now again, the United Kingdom has led the way in combat combating international counter-terrorist efforts via the Five Eyes, Signet, and as a founding member of the Global Counter-Terrorism Forum. And the UK will maintain those responsibilities, EU member or not. In contrast, the EU reaction to the migrant crisis has been unhelpful in, it, in extreme and its reactions unhelpful and just like those of a rabbit in the headlights. The EU has its border control, Frontex, which consumes several hundred millions of euros but is non-operational and little more than a data collection and analysis agency. Produces reports and stats, fine supposed to coordinate the activities of member states in border control according to its charter. But in fact it has no operational capability and it has to rely on NATO, individual member states and other operational forces to do anything useful. Indeed we've got a basic conflict of interest here for Frontex in that the EU mantra is open borders with no control. The EU probably never imagined that its open border mantra would encourage the movement of criminals, terrorists and weapons. The result has been that a number of countries have had to take unilateral action to defend their borders and actually as a result breaking their treaty obligations. But just look at Intersen, set up as a fledgling European intelligence agency, yet another failure, doing little more than gathering data. The collection of data such as fingerprints mentioned already by others at the borders within Europe has been a disastrous example. Only 17% of migrants at key points of entry have been fingerprinted. And to make matters worse, even if their fingerprints have been taken, no one within member states has been allowed to share that data. There could be no greater gift to terrorism than being invisible and untraceable, yet this is what the European Union approach facilitates. 
We have talked about PNR. Well, that is stuck in turgid debates, as we well know. But there are issues about privacy and human rights, and I do wonder, having been criticised for the comment of front, uh, uh, front, frontier, sorry, frontier Europe, are we not actually building that? For too many in this Parliament, the response is, and rectification of these failures, we need more Europe. And we heard that this afternoon. Well, would anyone pour more money into an approach and into structures that are broken, they're ill-conceived and they're ineffective, but they can be addressed, just not by doing more of the same. That is the definition of an idiot. It could well be argued that the EU should stick to matters that it can usefully address and do well, but stay out of matters where it does not have the experience or capability. General yeah. Michael Hayden, ex-head of NSA in the US, said, security is a national issue. Now, it's time the EU and the Parliament opened to its eyes to what's going on. Well, James, comes a bit at some end there. Uh, please conclude. And just bear in mind that the future is and should be recognised bilateral agreements based on good data exchange, trusted data exchange and experience is the way forward, not trying to Thank coerce 28 member states to do one thing. Thank you very much. Now for the ENF group, Mr De Graaf. Mr President, my sympathy goes to the victims of the recent attacks in Brussels. And it's um, incredibly bitter and poignant that those attacks could have been avoided. National borders should have been closed long before because these Islamist he heroes were travelling freely between um, the Netherlands and Belgium. And of course, creating these um, ghettos, those perpetrators have become heroes there as martyrs. And I think that um, everyone who has allowed that to happen um, is, sh shares the, the blame, whether they're members of this parliament or of the commission or the member state governments who plea uh, for opening the doors, opening the frontiers, and then, th and, that's the, and then people die as a result. How hypocritical was it, was this um, remembering the victims, grieving for the victims when a part of this parliament itself has created conditions and creates conditions for the, the, uh, those attacks and other attacks. And I believe that all forms of counter-terrorism has to start with acknowledging the causes of the terrorism. And you do not want to see that and to name, name the names. The, origin, the source, the root cause is Islam. And since for 1400 years it has been the source and 240 million people have, have been uh, killed over that period in its name. It's not, a, it's not friendly to our Western values and cannot be integrated into our Western cultures. And to you and to the Commission, recognise the folly and recognise we've got to change tack because the way to go is closing the national borders. It's stopping mass immigration and stopping Islam in its tracks. Thank you very much. Uh, Mrs. Voutmans wants to ask you a question. Sorry, could you just let the colleague put their headphones on first? Where's Mrs. Voutmans? Please, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. President, Mr. De Graaf. Do you think that the closing of the border? Thank you very much. Do you really think that closing the borders would be the solution to dealing with this? Do you think, for example, the Netherlands all by themselves could fight against this type of terrorism? Uh, it's crazy listening to you. You're saying that all uh, Muslims are terrorists. I think you need to reread your history books. It's war. Uh, 
that is causing these people to flee. Please be reasonable. Het is uh, uh, meneer de voorzitter. Ook hier hoor ik weer het typische wegkijken, ontkennen, negeren. Yes. I think we're seeing uh, denial here, permanent uh, denial of the situation in Belgium, in Molenbeek itself, in other neighborhoods of Brussels as well. There were people dancing in the streets when the attacks in Malbec and Zaventemp took place. And again and again we have these stupid questions. So that's what that yet the, the fraction slows up. Mr. Von Tulis has the floor next. Ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, once again, we had uh, moments of silence for the victims of the terrorist attacks in Brussels. Uh, Chairman, you said that we will not forget the victims. Unfortunately, we are going to forget and we are going to mention them if we have a new terrorist attack. The only who will not forget are the relatives and the friends of the victims. We shouldn't let fear become hatred. That's what you said. I don't know if it will turn into hatred. It will become anger, anger against us, because with wishes we're trying to armor and protect lives in Europe. The enemy is known. There are those who, in the name of God, re uh, take away lives. There are, the, uh, there are the activists of the Islamic State who are active in the whole planet. It would have terrorism before the Haliphate. It will exist after its eradication as long as we have fanatics. The terrorists are using the immigration flows and they can move without any controls between the European member countries and the um, training camps. Uh, so they, they want to combat our fundamental rights and we're going to have this combat. We have to face the roots of the problem. Anybody lives or wants to live in Europe first and above all should accept the European values and principles. Not our manias but those of the European citizens. Otherwise the result will be always tragic. Thank you. Next for the EPP, Mr. Gonzalez Pons. President, I would like to start with a protest. This is a very important debate, and yet we do not see the uh, presidents of the far right and far left groups represented here. If people had died in the UK or France, they would be here making their presence known. And we've heard extraordinary things like Islam is a terrorist ideology or Europe is... is to blame for terrorism. You cannot say such things to victims looking them in the eye. President, I call on you to ask the two political groups who've said that Europe is responsible for terrorism or that Islam is a terrorist uh, ideology to withdraw. People hear what we say here elsewhere. If we sow fear, we will reap fear. If we sow hatred, we will reap hatred. And if we sow lack of understanding, we will reap lack of understanding. A policeman can arrest a terrorist, but only a politician can end terrorism. And politics has to come from unity, and we have to have understanding and inclusion of victims. If you have a policy which is based on the idea of well-being and prosperity not being the exclusive prerogative of the West, but being an aspiration for the whole of humanity, then we can do this. It's not about Muslims or refugees, it's about terrorists. Islam is not a terrorist religion. Jihadism is an ideology, not a religion. So you cannot combat jihadism only with the police. You combat it with a pencil, with a book, with a school. Fellow members, we cannot tackle terrorism if we do not identify the enemy. We're not talking about the enemies of any particular country. We're talking about the enemies of freedom. Uh, what a paradox that we should be building walls in Europe to stop refugees coming in because we're scared of them when they are the victims. Those refugees are fleeing people who live alongside us. So those walls will stop the victims coming in and we'll be alone in our own countries with the people persecuting those victims. We could end up in a situation where Europe and politics itself sees no way out. Thank you very much, Mr. Gonzalez Pons.
there is a question for you. You do not have to accept a blue card. So that's up to each member. But Mr. Fontoulis has uh, asked if uh, he can use his blue card. Okay, Peter there. Mr. Gonzalez, I think you misunderstood what I've said. I didn't mention all, I don't talk about all Muslims, but about fanatic Islamists. What they cry when they make their attacks, Allahu Akbar, does it mean something to you? They murder innocent people in the name of God, their God. Querido uh, colega, I didn't misinterpret your words. I was not actually referring to you. I was referring to the Front National. When the Paris attacks took place, Marine Le Pen was here with us calling for a European reaction. Now we've seen attacks in Belgium. It appears that uh, it is not felt quite so deeply by her. Next for the S&D, Mr. Tarabella. We were tipped into horror at the end of March when terrorism hit in the heart of Europe and on the 22nd of March we were all victims to various degrees of attacks which are nothing other than attacks, attacks on our freedom, our liberty and our way of life. It is a disgusting, uh, nauseating uh, attack and uh, there's been an attempt to bring about a regime of terror and we mustn't concede any of our democratic advances because if democracy flees it will be the fascists and the terrorists that gain ground. So colleagues we have to forget our political differences and join together to ensure that these atrocities are brought to an end. We have to place an accent on security on the one hand. It's a fundamental right for all citizens. We can only feel free and we mustn't give in to repression. Our police forces, our judiciary, our defense organizations must all work hand in hand in perfect harmony and have a better exchange of data as uh, has been recalled. And we must guarantee peace for our citizens. It's only together that we can conquer terrorism and it is obviously clear that uh, Daesh must be put in a position where they cannot harm us and allowing us and the rest of the world to live in peace and stability. One word to conclude, colleagues. Our values and principles, solidar solidarity and the ability to live together mustn't be threatened by terrorist bullets. Uh, this is barbaric. There is no other word for it. We will continue to stick up for our freedom, our freedoms, and this will mean more Europe, Mr. Kamal, more Europe and better Europe. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you very much, Mr. Tarabella. Next for the uh, ECR, Mr. Demis Maka. Collega's, ja, eerst en vooral wil ik ook namens mijn delegatie mijn. Thank you very much, President. Thank you, colleagues. On behalf of my group, I would like to pass on my condolences to those affected by the terrorist attacks on the 22nd of March. We hope all those who were wounded in these attacks will uh, recover soon. And our thanks to the emergency services. These uh, attacks uh, were happened close to my office uh, where I work. Uh, I passed uh, my youth in uh, Brussels. I know that real uh, people from Brussels are open, they're tolerant, they have a sense of humour, they like life. And that's why this uh, terrorist attack hits us so hard. I know that citizens expect to feel safe. The EU can bring added value through targeted initiatives. What I expect from this Parliament is that we adopt new legislative texts such as on passenger name records, for example. Despite these uh, efforts made by national authorities, this has been blocked here in this House. That is a shame. Even after the attacks in Paris, this file was contested here in Parliament. It was a, a scandal, really. Uh, how ironic now that some are asking uh, for uh, a European-wide system now and a modification of the treaties. Mr. Hofstadt uh, has left now. But we're seeing these same colleagues who who are calling for an exchange of information. The uh, terrorists are getting uh, richer. 
is it really excessive uh, uh, to ask for uh, some compromise on data protection so we don't have terrorists slipping through the net. Certain member states are not very diligent when it comes to uh, information exchange. Europol's new anti-terrorism uh, centre needs to become a platform for cooperation. Otherwise, we will never achieve what we want to. There has to be information exchange. Just a specific question to the Commission. We have talked about an existing database. How is it possible that Europol barely uses the uh, database uh, as they have already, such as the fingerprint uh, databases? They have had the authorization to use this information, but they do not seem to be using it at all. You said it yourself. How is that the case? Next, uh, for the Liberals, Mrs. Inveld. Um, I think we, we have to note that the so-called war on terror has failed. For 15 years now, since 9-11, we've been passing one measure after the other, and every time the terrorists are one step ahead. It is high time that we rethink our strategy, and not every, after every attack in the Pavlov reflex, talk about new megalomaniac IT systems, because what we need is not more dots. We need to connect the dots. So, and I wonder, I mean, I've been listening to the debate on PNR for many years now. There, there isn't a debate that is as fact-free as the debate on PNR. There's a lot of genuine ignorance, but also a lot of lies. And I would really like to know what has been keeping the member states from setting up national PNR system. As a matter of fact, they've received 50 million euros from the European Commission for setting up those systems. We don't know what happened to the money. France, that has been pushing for PNR, they received 18 million euros. What's happened to the money? They've got the legislation in place. So, instead of talking about new IT system all the time, what we need, one, is sharing information, mandatory sharing information, and I don't understand why the EPP and the ECR are categorically opposed. Two, I'm concluding, United Chairman, oh. human intelligence, three, prevention. That is what we should be investing in because that will bring greater security to our, to our citizens and not just talk, talk, talk about IT systems. There's a question from Mr. Wolf for you, Mrs. Infeld. Mr. Wolf, please go ahead. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. Vett, you have said that this Parliament has failed to implement measures to protect its citizens and that we, what we must do is join the dots in order to do so. Is somebody such as the former Secretary General of Interpol, Ronald K. Noble, who understands terrorism on an international stage, someone who's failed to join the dots when he says this about open borders in Europe? Europe's open border arrangement which enables travel through 26 countries without passport checks or border controls, is effectively an international passport-free zone for terrorists to execute attacks on the continent and make their escape. Has he failed to make the dots, or is it you? Mr. Wall, first of all, I, I did not say that this parliament has failed to implement. Quite the opposite. I said that we have been passing one legislative measure after the others. And actually, like data retention, it is not being implemented by the member states. Uh, and we will have the same problem with the PNR directive. But you cannot deny, and certainly not after the Brussels and the Paris attacks, that so much information on the terrorists was available and it has not been shared. It's been sitting in the drawer and it wasn't used. And whether we're talking about 9-11, Boston, Toulouse, uh, London, Madrid, Brussels, Paris, uh, the killing of Theo van Gogh, Mumbai. In every single case, the terrorists were known to the authorities beforehand, Vielen but Dank. they failed to share the information. Oh, they need to connect the dots. That's what they need to start doing. Vielen Dank. Das Wort hat jetzt für die Fraktion. Next uh, for the GUI group, Mrs. Ernst. Anschläge mit ihren wirklich grausamen. If you analyze the terrible effects of the terrorist attacks, then you be it becomes clear that you have to track down these uh, perpetrators as soon as possible, and obviously you have to cover it better. There's no doubt about it. But you can have as many measures as you'd like, and you can dig out 
old measures and incorporate them as well, just to, to, as far as you want. But actually, what needs to happen here is something for uh, the coherence of our society. If we've got relevant parts of society who have no say, if there are certain groups who are socially marginalized, then we've got uh, a breeding ground for IS. And if in our life in society we don't have a place, if the terror militias uh, can exploit young people and bring them round to their way of thinking. Well, no, we've got to make sure that we put efforts into schools, uh, uh, communities, churches, religious communities, etc. And without the help of Muslims, IS terror cannot be put at an end to. And we must do something to change this. We can't just carry on down the same road. We need an overall or a holistic concept according to which we act and all sources of terrorism must finally be put paid to. Next, Mrs. Julie for the Greens. Monsieur le Président. President, terrorism has struck again. After Paris, we saw uh, Brussels, Bamako, Tunis, Istanbul, Lahore and many other cities. We have to heal our wounds and then prevent another occurrence, but in an intelligent manner without falling into the trap of uh, putting forward false solutions that only appear to be so. We need to give true protection to citizens without making false promises. That I think should be your priority. We should not undermine our fundamental freedoms. Some feel that an uh, omnipotent state spying on all its citizens will be infallible. But I would say no. Uh, that is a lie uh, which comes from self-interest. Information is out there. What we need is cooperation between member states and exchanges of intelligence. When you have exchanges of intelligence at present, the data are often not properly processed. So that's a lack of European ambition which is paralyzing everything from the economy, through treatment of refugees, through to combating terrorism. So we need to ensure that we have effective coordination in place so that there is an area of freedom, security and justice. That is what the EU should be. Thank you very much. Next for the ENF, uh, Mr. Philibot. Ladies and gentlemen, Commission, the drama in Brussels after the terrible attacks in Paris shows us once again the shortfalls of your Europe that allows criminals and traffickers and terrorists to move freely once again you are trying to sell the people that it was only in a federal way will be able to find a solution that's wrong the only way to stop criminals are national borders those that you have destroyed national controls police customs all of these things that European austerity is chipped away at member states have the competence the duty the responsibility to keep their citizens secure. By weakening member states, they have seriously endangered the lives of our fellow citizens. European agencies have never worked and will never work. National services have been weakened. They are no, now no longer able to cooperate effectively. European agencies will never be able to replace them. They're simply making the situation more uh, ineffective. It's no surprise that in one of the most weakened states of the EU, Belgium, that radical Islam has found a refuge. The so-called capital of Europe has unfortunately become a capital of crime. Ladies and gentlemen of the Commission, your ideology is blinding you. You cannot anticipate what is coming. Islamic State had clearly said they would use the flow of migrants to get terrorists into Europe, people to kill us. 
how did you think this would not come to pass? I remember people in this chamber were laughing at us when we were warning of this. You are letting the uh, traffickers uh, bring migrants in. You're letting the situation deteriorate in Syria. You're letting terrorists into the country. This is the responsibility of the EU in this situation. It's terrifying. Every single area where you could have gone wrong, you have gone wrong. You need to admit your mistakes and give back the freedom to the people that they are demanding. When we see this through uh, referendums such as uh, in the Netherlands and in uh, the Great Britain soon. The EU is disappearing and I think all the better. There will be more security, freedom, democracy and prosperity. Thank you very much. Das Wort hat jetzt der Fraktionslose. Next, Mr. Balsko. Thank you very much, Mr. President. In the European Council, a minister started her speech by saying that it all comes down to human rights. Well, I hope really for the first time that it comes down to European citizens and our rights. We're always hearing about the rights of migrants when we hear about these rights. On Monday, when I arrived back in Strasbourg, there were four placards about migrants and none about the events in Cologne. Now obviously we have to cooperate better but primarily it is ourselves that we must look to. We need to look ourselves in the eye. There have been attacks in Madrid and London in the past but really now there is a war being waged against Europe and the terrorist attacks are small signs of that war, but the war is that uh, Europe is going to be overflowed by migrants. Next for the EPP, Mrs. Holmeyer. President, Commissioner, Minister, colleagues, first of all, in the fight against terrorism, information exchange is extremely important. Now, clearly, there are deficits on the side of the member states. Sometimes they don't exchange enough data, sometimes not fast enough, and not enough has been done at an institutional level to promote these exchanges. But there is a problem here in Parliament, too. Every time we talk about European databases, there were always uh, concerns, particularly from the left uh, in the House, uh, from uh, Sophie Infelt as well, when we were talking about uh, Eurodac making this uh, available for uh, criminal authorities, for uh, for the police, so they could uh, compare this with the SIS uh, database as well. This was not made possible. We need databases, we need interoperability, we also need to trust our security authorities and we need to give them the tools so that they can use the databases optimally and get the best use of them. We need to be able to trust Europol and uh, Jan Philipp Albrecht when you say that Europol should be taken apart. I would like to uh, say that we believe Europol needs to be strengthened, they need better personnel and I think uh, that's very important. We should stop trying to obstruct each other here in Parliament but work together to move things forward and thirdly when it comes to the uh, terrorist uh, uh, directive, when it comes to travel we're talking about those who are uh, dangerous. We want to stop them traveling in either uh, direction to provide information to each other. I hope we'll be able to achieve this. We see radicalization on the internet. We need to try and counter this. It should not be uh, a legal vacuum on the internet. It should be the same as the world in which we live in. And when it comes to the financing of terrorism, there's still a lot to be done there as well to try and stop the financial flows to terrorists. We need to work together instead of working against each other. Thank you very much. Uh, Mrs. Van Brem, next for the S&D. Thank you. 
President, Commissioner, Minister, colleagues, I would also like to express my condolences to the victims of the terrible attacks. Belgians were deeply affected by that, of course, because Brussels is the Belgian capital, but it's also the capital of Europe, and we were all deeply shocked and affected, and indeed disappointed by how the debate has gone. We hear the far right finger-pointing, but after such a horrific terrorist attack, I don't think it's very seemly to have such a reaction. What Belgians and Europeans want is cooperation and solutions for all of us. So I believe that the proposals that we've heard to strengthen Europe and strengthen security are worthwhile. I would also like to pass on a message to you today. You will be aware that whatever country you're in, whatever nationality you're talking about or ethnicity, whether we're talking about people from Brussels, Belgium, France, what people are attacking is not these specific specificities, but a way of life, a European way of life. And I think part of the solution could be to further develop our values. Uh, young people, our children, should be brought up in uh, European values, diversity, openness, equality between women and men, freedom of speech. I think this will be vital if we are to find a solution. We need to create a true European identity. That's what we need. And it may sound strange, but I think it is part of the solution. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Van Brepp. Next for Aldi, Mr. Dupré. Apologies, uh, Mr. President. I was somewhat absent minded there. My country, Belgium, has been attacked and isn't the first and probably, unfortunately, won't be the last to be confronted by the horror of bloody terrorism. We, our hearts go out to the victims and we thank all of those who share that grief with us. Obviously, we are aware of some shortcomings and we've been too slow in facing up to what lurked beneath the surface in some parts of our capital but that's not a reason as some are suggesting to suggest that our country has become the capital of crime in Europe and is only responsible for the terrorist attacks that are happening throughout Europe our police services our information services five services and all the others are being falsely and unjustly accused and I would like on behalf of them to thank them uh, sorry I would like to thank them people looking for scapegoats uh, coming up with old-fashioned solutions we need to uh, strengthen Europe or we need to link together the European databases we created we need to make a mandatory transmission of sensitive data it is together that we are attacked and it is together that we will win thank you very much to Mr. Dupré for the Green Group Mr. Albrecht thank you very much President uh, we've heard at the beginning of this debate uh, that Guy Verhofstadt said he was sitting together with Jean-Claude Juncker in the European Council after 9-11 discussing the security measures and still we haven't achieved what we wanted to have there at that time but that also means you've been and others have been responsible for the security policy of the last 15 years and this, the security policy of the last 15 years was a one-track policy which was saying more and more data needs to be acquired and it got to be on the cost of policemen on the street. Since then we cut down in each of the member states the number of policemen in, on the streets. We, we brought uh, more and more technology systems in place, expensive technology on the heavy lobbying of a security uh, industry. Okay, fine. But the problem is we are now lacking the real security policy on the ground which is bringing effective security. And the Greens in this House are the only ones who are proposing a solution for that, which is a targeted approach on passenger name records, for example, which looks, looks at the risks and the suspicions and gathers the information on those 
those who are suspects and all of those who have been attackers in the past have been suspects. That would have been the solution. So I would ask you to follow our advice and go this direction. Thank you. Mr. Albrecht, there's a blue card. Mr. Atkins, Mrs. Atkinson has a question for you. Oh, Atkinson, entschuldigung. It's a funny old world when I start agreeing with the Greens, but you're absolutely right. Since 9/11, uh, we've been talking about this. You know, we're quite a, a few years on. Now, in my country, as in your country, we've had Muslims living amongst us for 40 years. But when they first came 40 years ago, they had to learn English. They had to integrate. But because of the left and the push for multiculturalism, I have met women in my constituency and across my country, as indeed across the Europe, European states, where they've forgotten to speak the, the, the mother tongue. Until we get to grips with that, do you not agree with me that we can't move on? No matter what is said in this chamber today, you should listen to Saeed Kamal. He's the one that spoke okay. the most sense today. Mr. Albrecht, would you like to answer that? I'm going to answer in German. I think, and I have to agree with the previous speaker who referred to this point, that it is not credible to suggest that religion was decisive in uh, these attacks. Many of the victims of the terror attacks who died were Muslims. Many of the victims were believers. It had nothing to do with what happened. It was to do with radicalization, which is down to the wrong policy being pursued in prisons where people are radicalized, but your agitation helps to contribute to that radicalization. We will not be contributing to peace if we continue to promote hatred. Mr. Annemans for ENF Group. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you very much, President. As a member, I would like to speak out against the tone of your discourse yesterday when you paid tribute to the victims in Brussels. You talked about them being victims of extremists come from the exterior. Now, clearly not all Muslims are terrorists. I don't think anybody said that, but let's not be naive either. Yesterday in the New York Times, uh, we read that 90% of uh, young people in uh, Molenbeek believe that the Brussels terrorists are heroes. I think we have the right to ask questions about integration and the type of Europe that you are proposing. It's really quite disappointing to hear European officials say these things. Herr Billet. Mr. Bennett for the EPP group. Thank you, well, uh, Voorzitter, uh, Commissaris. Thank you, President, Commissioner, fellow members. Good afternoon. Three weeks on, we recall the horrors of the 22nd of March. They're still fresh in our mind. There were many fatalities and families affected, and I think the 22nd of March will be engraved in our memory as a very sad day in our history. London, Paris, Madrid, Brussels, could all those attacks have been prevented. There is an issue of collective responsibility, but there's no point in looking for scapegoats. We have to find structural solutions to help us avoid any repeat of such horrors. I think a lot of the solution is to be found at European level over the next few weeks, not months or years, but over the next few weeks, we need to give assurances to the families of victims and to all Europeans that we will be taking effective measures to combat such tragedies. We need to have uh, data exchanged between national intelligence services. We need to ensure that uh, we pool data more effectively. A, a European FBI would be fantastic, but it will take time. And uh, to do it between 28 countries would be difficult. So let's be realistic. Let's start with some national authorities. President, perhaps we could have a coalition of the willing. Those who want to go forward could go forward. 
so that we could try to tackle the sources of financing for terrorism and an exchanges of intelligence would be vital to that. The PNR should be approved on Thursday. I see that council representatives are here. Minister, greetings. I hope we can count on your cooperation. I hope that your contact with political parties will mean that things will go forward and you will be able to convince all those who remain to be convinced so that the PNR can be adopted. We owe this to victims and their families. Thank you very much, Mr. Bellet. Mr. Bellet, there is a question for Mr. Chani for you. Is that okay, Mr. Chani? Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Mr. Bellet has often talked about good intentions and the importance of the intelligence services working together, but is that enough? There's a lot of concerns about data protection as well. I think we are responsible in some way here too. We need to ensure sufficient data protection. Do you agree with the current data protection? Mr. Bennett. Geachte collega, ik verwijs naar wat onze fractie. Dear colleague, I would refer you to Mr. Weber's comments a moment ago. There was a, an identical question earlier. We need to have full assurances within the proposals before us, and we do in the PNR uh, proposals. We don't want a US style system. We don't want to have citizens' uh, data out there without privacy protection. We need to ensure that there is a body that ensures that uh, legislation is being respected and that privacy is being respected. We do not want a US style system and that is not what the PNR proposal has in it. So I call on you to approve PNR on Thursday. For the Social and Democratic Group, Mr. Zippel. Thank you. Recent attacks in Brussels had one clear objective to try and injure and kill as many people as possible to spread fear in this lively European city. And our reaction to this and other cowardly attacks can only be more togetherness and more cooperation. There have been numerous European instruments that have been brought in, the Schengen Information System, the terrorism uh, uh, alert center and many other measures that have been introduced but none of these will be able to be used effectively and the information if the information is not adequately exchanged mr. Weber referred to the fact that the voluntary exchange of information has failed in Europol it's all the more surprising therefore that his group when it comes to to a binding measure has rejected it and there is more than one member state in which the provision of uh, codified police and other staff is insufficient and new measures are being presented, new data is always being collected and the actual challenges, the real challenges, require security policy responses at a European level, with European level responsibility. And we have to work together more effectively to try and tackle the problems of radicalization and violent uh, extremism in Europe, because it is only in that way that we will be able to face up to terrorism and at the same time allow for diversity, openness, and freedom. And so, yes more Europe, that is the answer to the challenge. Now for the Liberal group, Mr. Jicic. Well, I'm afraid the current situation is critical. Firstly, there are countries or their regions in the EU Southeast neighborhood where governing structures or their elements collapse or were weakened. 
Somewhere the power vacuum has been filled by Daesh and other fanatics spreading hate and terror. This poses an ongoing challenge for UN, EU external policy and our allies. Secondly, in some European districts the situation was overlooked and developed in a way that some people can be easy target for radicalization. The attacks were committed also by homegrown terrorists. To cope with this environment and change it, it represents a gigantic challenge for member states and their municipal authorities. The new unprecedented level of terrorist threat requires also new approaches to cope with it. Sharing information between member states, at least, must become a reality at last. It's also our role to work further on it, as well as on other elements of our common approach. No country can make it on its own. The EU with its allies can together. Das Wort hat jetzt für die ENF Fraktion. The one on now for the ENF group. La ringrazio presidente. Thank you, President Schultz. I would like to start by saying that Brussels is the capital of Europe. A study indicates that by 2020, half the inhabitants of Brussels will be Muslims. Will that be the capital of Europe? Not all Muslims are terrorists. That is true. But it is also true that all terrorists are Muslims. What do we want to do? Do we want to carry on like this and have complete submission to Islam. They use the Quran like a weapon when they carry out these attacks after New York, Madrid, London, Paris, twice, Brussels and others. We're still saying, oh, let's try and understand what should we should call it. It is Islamic terrorism. That's what it's called, Islamic terrorism. There's no other name for it. That's its name and that's what we should combat. That is where Europe should stand up and make itself heard. Because what do they say? Allah Akbar. They say long live Allah. Is that a normal religion? A democratic religion? It's the only religion that kills in the name of God and harms everyone. Das Wort hat jetzt für die EVP Fraktion. Now for the EPP group, Mrs. Dati. Ja, bitte sehr. Herr Bonanno, Sie... Mr. Bonanno, would you take a question from Mrs. Gomez? Bitte sehr, Frau Gomez. Mrs. Gomez. Mr. Bonanno, I'm asking you, Mr. President, to actually curb this member who is insulting one main religion, Islam, with something which absolutely does not represent that religion. And it is not mine. I have none. Ja, ich nehme Ihre Lektion zur... I take note of that, Madam, and the floor now goes to Mrs. Dati. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you very much, President. The terrorist attacks in Brussels and Paris should not remain unpunished. We need to act very strongly against these terrorists, but we need to look at our methods of investigation, our information gathering, so we can better identify these individuals that are radicalized and commit these terrorist barbarities. I myself did a report recently on preventing radicalization. Members from all groups were involved and contributed to adopting this report. Measures are being uh, put in place, such as the reform of the Schengen Code and strengthening information exchange on criminal records. Also also the creation of a de-radicalization program at a European level. I hope the PNL will be voted uh, this Thursday coming. Other measures have been put in place, such as those explained by Mr. Uh, Dupré, who I fully support. I would also like to call on the European Commission to finally put forward proposals, clear proposals, to fight against these barbaric acts. It's not uh, enough uh, simply to recall our principles. European uh, citizens are, are tired of such attitudes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Dati. For the S&D group, Mrs. Fayon now. Thank you very much, President. The terrorist attacks in Brussels have shaken us all again. These are despicable acts, unworthy of humanity. I would like to express my condolences to all the victims, all the wounded and others who were hurt. 
not only in Belgium but also in Turkey, Pakistan, Iraq and elsewhere. Terrorists, racists and extremists spread their hatred through violence and intimidation. And there are more and more tensions in Europe between different uh, communities. We will only be able to come out victorious if we fight terrorism and hatred together, uh, regardless of religion, race, skin color or position. We have to strive for a feeling of togetherness. We have to uh, tackle social issues at home and in uh, third countries. We have to fight poverty and resolve conflicts. That's why people are fleeing those countries. European member states have a lot of difficulties exchanging uh, information. That's why we have to make sure that we cooperate within Europe and with third countries. We also, also have to talk about the elephant in the room. Why do young Europeans go to Syria, go to Iraq? Why do they kill? Why do they feel closer to an ide ideology that supports mass uh, killings, mass beheadings? We have to talk about uh, this hopelessness among our youth. We have to fight Islamophobia. We need uh, to restart the interreligious dialogue across the world. Thank you. Mr. Sveja has a question for you, Mrs. Fayon. Would you accept the question? Dear colleague, since uh, we know what your uh, position on PNR is, I would like to ask the following question. If we adopt this act in the European Parliament, will this be a step forward towards a more secure Europe? Well, uh, the PNR package that we are voting on tomorrow is a step forward to more, towards more security. But we have to be extremely clear when we weigh the balance of these measures, when we see if they're efficient and effective. We also have to make sure that data is properly secured. I think that these measures are correct, and I think we need to ensure what uh, our citizens want from us. Thank you very much, Mrs. Fayon. Madam Metzola for the EPP. I was in Brussels both during and after the attacks. And while people were scared, there was a palpable feeling of defiance, a determination not to allow these murderous thugs to condition how we live our lives. But as shock begins to give way to anger, we must have the tools to respond to ensure that our law enforcement agencies are one step ahead. The first step must be to immediately implement a PNR system. Any moves to derail the process within this House would be really unhelpful and unacceptable. We must strengthen Europol. If we do not have adequate sharing of information, then criminals and terrorists will continue to exploit gaps in our intelligence apparatus. States also need better powers to reconsider and revoke passports of those who travel to Syria and other conflicts only to return to Europe to recruit and radicalize more citizens. These so-called foreign fighters do not deserve the protection their European passports grant them. Finally, we must come down harder on those who spread hate within our communities as well as those who abuse the Internet to spread their message of evil. In Brussels, men, women and children from every nationality, from every background and from every religion were killed. No one was spared. This was an attack on all of us. Thank you very much. Ms. Kinichi for the S&D Group now. Thank you. President, I would like to start by expressing my condolences to the victims of the recent attacks and their families. I was in Brussels on the 22nd of March. I went through that period of tension. I hope such events never occur again. Although it is, of course, true that the situation is still critical, and we're working on a directive for harmonization of criminal legislation for combating terrorism together with our Libe colleagues. We need to ensure that EU legislation is in line with the new terrorist threat that we face while still respecting our principles. Police forces and intelligence agencies, as well as national judicial authorities, need to cooperate more. But it's not sufficient to have repressive policies. There are systemic problems giving rise to violent phenomena. 
and we need prevention uh, rather than repression. We need education and integration to prevent marginalization and radicalization. I very much hope that the EU will be able to develop its foreign policy and common defense policy so that we can tackle the complex international uh, issues which give rise to the root causes of terrorism. Thank you very much. From the EPP, Mrs. Jimenez Beso de Barrio. Thank you very much, uh, President. If I had two minutes, I would give one uh, in for a minute of silence in memory of the victims, but I will use my voice instead to speak on behalf of the terror, uh, victims of terror. Etta uh, assassinated my brother, and so I would like to speak out from the very bottom of my heart to condemn these savage attacks in the heart of Europe. People are starting to think this is inevitable in society. This is what happens. No, a thousand times no. This is not what we do. We love, we dream, we work, we live in safety, in freedom. In order to achieve this, we have to face up uh, to terrorism without all this hypocrisy. Victims need more than photographs and candles we need to go after the terrorists, those who are radicalizing though, those who go to Syria to learn to kill us. I refuse to say that we die because it's our own fault. This type of attitude is responsible for terrorism and promotes terrorism. We need to act now. Any one of us could have been amongst the dead or wounded. This time uh, it wasn't us, but it could happen to us. And I want to say to the victims that we will be there to defend them, to defend their memory and uh, democracy and justice. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. jimenez Besadil. Uh, thank you very much, madam. If you would mind listening. Ladies and gentlemen, you may only have one minute speaking time. It's not long, but if in that minute you squeeze in a three minute long text, it is pretty much impossible for the interpreters to do that. You're speaking faster than they're even able to listen, let alone speak. And so even if you've only got one minute, please do make an effort to speak for a minute's worth. And now Mr. Nida Müller. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. In the wake of the terror terrorist attacks, we all feel emotional, we feel we wish to express our condolences, but we mustn't lose our sobriety. We have to ensure that we maintain our rational mode of thought, because it is only in thinking rationally that we'll be able to fight this. Many populists wish to equate terrorism with migration. They set up bogeymen and we mustn't allow this to be done. The hate that they generate is one of the greatest impediments that we find in fighting terrorism because hatred is often a way to try and control people by making them f frightened And many governments have been incapable of stepping up to the plate and doing something about it. We have to have cooperation. We have to work together. We have to have a European intelligence service. We have to work preventatively to prevent radicalization, to fight terrorism, and ensure that the old idea of Europe is still the new idea. So you have a question from Mr. Etheridge. Mr. Etheridge, you may put your question. Thank you. Um, would you not agree with me that political correctness is one of the biggest barriers towards actually combating terrorism? If you identify where a threat is coming from, surely you must therefore take action against that, whether or not it suits the political agenda or not. If it comes from 
the, the results of mass immigration or from a particular immigrant community, surely that must be recognised and action taken to deal with that. Otherwise, you put political correctness above safety. Mr. Niedermiller. You have to look terrorism in the eye, but political correctness is not something that should get in the way of that. We confront terrorism and it all comes down to taking responsibility and being aware of it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now for the EPP group. Thank you very much, Chairman. Ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, with so many terrorist attacks and so many victims, the time came to pass from theory to uh, practice. We know the identity of the terrorists, the second uh, generation uh, terrorists, European citizens that were radicalized and are trained to hate uh, Europe, democracy and its institutions. We do not know how they are trained, how they are armed and how they are financed. Prevention and combating the phenomenon needs uh, combined actions and a joint uh, European counterterrorism um, policy. We need a PNR, control of external front, uh, frontiers, control of the Internet, and we need a cooperation of the judicial and police services. How many lives and how many terrorist attacks should we accept in the future to understand that there is no contradiction between security and freedom? They go hand in hand. One is a precondition for the other. Only safe citizens can be really free. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Axel. Foss for one minute. Thank you very much. We owe it to the victims and their families to bring these perpetrators to justice. We need to tackle this threat that is now a permanent threat, so it's a priority for us to deal with this. We need to take political responsibility here. We need to invest in the police, in the intelligence services, in uh, technology, in our military. If we don't do this, we will lose this fight. Now, it's not always helpful when we hear it from the left that uh, they want to protect uh, the data of terrorists more than the lives of our own citizens. For four or five years, uh, there have been requests from the EPP turned down. It's too late now today. We have uh, amendments to PNR again that are still not related to taking political responsibility here. Herr Voss, Herr Voss, es gibt a Mr. Voss, there's a blue card from Mrs. Interfeld. Would you accept it? No? No? In that case, the next speaker is Ms. Elisabetta Gardini for one minute. Sì, grazie, President. Thank you. President, I must say that it was very worrying to discover that terrorists are moving in the shadows because of the gaps in our legislation. And some of those gaps in our legislation could have been filled in the past. So it's rather uncomfortable to hear people making comments about the PNR, for instance, where in June 2013 it was held up. We've been trying to get it for years. It may not be a panacea, but it is a useful instrument, a very useful instrument. That's what everyone says. And the director of Europol said it the other day. But it took Charlie Hebdo, Bataclan, the Brussels attacks to happen for things to change. I hope we will vote it through on Thursday. Like I say, it's far from being a panacea, but it is a useful instrument. Thank you very much, Mrs. Gardini. You have a blue card from Mrs. Interfeld. Will you take it? You want a blue card from Mrs. Interfeld? 
You don't have the microphone on. No, non accetto. No, I do not accept. She's had enough time to give her, share her own opinions. I think it's sufficient. So, um, the next one is Mr. Paolo Angel for one minute. Uh, Thank you very much, Madam President. I would like to start by expressing my solidarity with all the victims of the Brussels attacks. And I would, of course, like to condemn those attacks. That said, I think it is vital for us to deal with security issues and internal security issues within the EU institutions. We need to strengthen European instruments. This means strengthening institutions such as Europol, of course, and the intelligence services and the pooling of intelligence, but it also requires PNR. And Ms. Interfelt has put forward the idea that the PNR doesn't uh, add anything, but then why is she uh, afraid of it? What harm could it do if it uh, doesn't add anything? So I don't understand this obsession with the PNR. You have to ask. If you ask, I will say. So, um, Herr Angel, akzeptieren Sie eine blaue Karte? Mr. Rango, will you accept a blue card from Mrs. Infeld? Yay, finally, yes. <laughs> I thought this was becoming a new rule in the EPP. Uh, I have never said, I mean to be correct, uh, that we categorically reject the use of PNR data, but first there has to be added value. And I would like to understand if there is only collection of data on national level, but no exchange, then what is the added value of a European directive? And I don't understand, it really escapes me, why the EPP, the ECR and the member state governments continue to refuse the mandatory sharing of information. If we had that, I'd be all on your side. I would like to stress the following point. If what Ms. Interfelt and her group are saying is that the PNER has no added value, then why, why reject it? If it doesn't add anything, then it's not going to cause any more problems. So that's what I don't get. That's the, what I don't understand. If you don't think it's going to uh, change anything or add anything, then just vote in favour. Good. The next rednerin is nun The next speaker is Ugrafka Schwitzer for one minute. As we heard, terrorism does not know borders. On the 22nd of March, jihadists uh, hit hard uh, the heart of Europe. They uh, killed over 30 people and injured uh, several hu uh, hundreds. Uh, this made us aware in Europe that our heart um, has been threatened and uh, we the politicians uh, are not prepared to address it. Um, terrorism from Malbec is uh, hitting hard the very core of the European project and they are sending the message that nobody can uh, neglect. Uh, Paris, uh, Brussels, Madrid, they represent warnings. The European Union needs to be a secure place. We need to enjoy uh, our uh, freedoms. I agree with Mr. Juncker. We uh, need to cooperate. We need to exchange information. We urgently need the, the PNR uh, directive uh, voted. We need to harmonize our directive. We need to act in coordination. However, I would like to say that we need to uh, uh, differentiate between uh, is Islam as a religion and um, radical uh, Islamism. And uh, we have to be but I have um, well two blue cards for you I'll start with the first one who raised it Mr. Jakovcic do you accept the blue card from him Mr. Jakovcic 30 seconds 
Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Shuitza, for accepting my blue card. I would like to ask you the following. Do you agree with me that apart from what we have to do ourselves within the European Union, it is also very important to act uh, on, the, on the borders, especially in the Western Balkans? You talked about it, but I think that many things need to be done in the Western Balkans because we are all aware of, of potential dangers in Bosnia and Herzegovina, perhaps in other countries as well but in particular Bosnia and Herzegovina. So do you agree with me that we need to do more in terms of cooperation with Bosnia and Herzegovina? I completely agree with you, with Mr. Uh, Jakovic. Uh, Southeast Europe represents a potential uh, danger, threat, especially Bosnia and Herzegovina. I'm aware of what is going on there. I also have certain data regarding this. It is up to us, to politicians, to help Bosnia and Herzegovina uh, on their path towards the European Union and to prevent what might uh, happen from... Um and next is Ms. Kinga Gal for one minute. Each time we have these terror attacks, it's a shock. This can happen at any time. It causes a lot of fear. But our job is not to let fear win. That is the situation. You can't have a freedom without security. We need to make sure that European citizens can feel safe again. This means we have to take rigorous, comprehensive steps here. We need to uh, have a cooperation at a European level when it comes to the police and the security services. We need to avoid people coming into Europe who are already uh, identified as terror risks. They abuse the Schengen system when they come into Europe. That's why the PNR system is really important and the exchange of information is also very important indeed and we hope that finally the left will understand that there is a justification here to protect our citizens. Mr. Omakaras, next for one minute. Mr. President, Madam President, Commissioner, what else has to happen before we join together in a more comprehensive way to do absolutely everything to ensure that the mistakes made in the past won't be repeated and that there will be a proper attempt to fight the causes and we can plug the gaps in our society and make sure that the European Union's ability to act is guaranteed. Cooperation when it comes to the exchange of data subject to a mandatory requirement will only be possible if we have European capacities and I am very much in favour of the proposal. Uh, certainly what Mr. Verhofstadt said and uh, also what was said about the security union. We do need a master plan. We need a timetable and an action plan. What is going to happen by when? And it's not just about the internal security, it's about external security as well. We have to check our foreign policy, our defence policy, our development policy in the regions where the causes for terrorism have arisen. Thank you very much. Next speaker is Barbara Matera for one minute. Grazie, Presidente. Thank you, Madam President. My thoughts are with Brussels and the people of Belgium. The day after the Brussels attacks, ministers of the interior said we must continue and be unstinting in our efforts to ensure that anti-terrorist legislation can be passed as soon as possible. And I believe that is true too. After months and months of postponement, we will finally be voting on PNR on Thursday. It's taken a long time to get here. It is my conviction that this is an instrument that could play a vital role in the identification of foreign fighters. Uh, we believe that it will provide useful information to national authorities on movements of suspects across our territories. The PNR directive will of course require an improvement in the exchanges of information between police 
and a better cooperation between our intelligence services and sharing of intelligence as well as cooperation between all member states. Thank you. Thank you. Vielen Dank. Der nächste Redner ist Herr Thank you very much. Next speaker, Michael Boni, for one minute. Many of us were personally touched by attacks in Brussels. We should act together if we want to ensure our security. The only answer is prevention. It means obligar obligatory model of sharing information among law enforcement in the real time with coordination at the European level, first of all cooperation of intelligence. Implementation of the PNR and smart borders control with guarantees of the real-time monitoring and processing the data. We need to adopt PNR in the shape as it is today. Fast work on the Directive on Counterterrorism, which is the key for fighting with all kinds of supporters of terrorism criminalizing their activities. We need coordinated approach to foreign fighters and ret returnees. To challenge the radicalization processes, educational offer for young people fight with extremism in the public area. To consider how to counteract the growing role of the dark net in promotion and supporting the terrorist groups. All of those tools are important for better prevention and the key in combating terrorism. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. I am not taking blue cards from people from the same group, just to clarify my position. The next uh, speaker is Mr. Zerfowski for one minute. Uh, thank you, um, Madam President. Colleagues, uh, terrorist attacks in Brussels have shown us again that Europe is not safe, as we often uh, repeat. But instead of uh, interconnecting of all intelligence and police services as fast as possible and launching a systematic operation uh, in Brus cooperation in Brussels where police don't cooperate and uh, as well as uh, Paris, uh, London, uh, Copenhagen uh, or The Hague where radical Islamists are uh, at home. Uh, we uh, keep talking um, only about terrorism uh, being a, a threat for Europe. That's what we've known for many years, haven't we? Europe uh, is not only uh, tackling uh, new arrivals, but it's uh, tackling problems of third uh, generations of migrants uh, who do not uh, recognize our values. The war has radicalized certain fundamentalist uh, religious groups, and that is what we need to fight. Ladies and gentlemen, Today's uh, European citizens do not want weak politicians who will come up only with praises. They want specific solutions. The last speaker before catch the eye is Anna Maria Kratzebild for one minute. Uh, Madam Chair, my heart is with all the victims and their families. Against terrorism, we need to be responsible and join forces across political groups to implement the anti terrorism pact. For the first, better sharing of information, strengthening the tools we have rather than creating new EU structures, as the problem is mutual trust. Member States must develop secure channels of information sharing that they can all trust. We should, of course, reinforce Europol and better sharing information also between criminal and terrorist records, better control our external borders, with biometric passports also for EU citizens. We have to update databases such as SIS, VIS, Eurodac, taking fingerprints and ensure information sharing and cross-checking in a secure way. And of course, Madam Chair, adopting the EU PNR and continuing with better financial tracking. Madam Chair, data protection should not be a hindrance to save lives of innocent people. We should stand up to our freedoms and open society and ensure citizens that we give us the tools to ensure their safety. Thank you, Madam Chair. There is a blue card for you from Mrs. Grappini. Will you accept that? Mrs. Grappini, 30 seconds. Thank you, Madam Chair. Actually, my blue card was uh, for the colleague of Ms. Corazza Bill, but they belong to the same group, so I'll ask my question. Europe is not a safe place, you said. And my dear colleagues, you mentioned a few things that the, the Commission should do, exchange of information and, and, and between databases, but this is already happening. The collection of data takes time. 
Uh, do you think that the Commission proceeded correctly when they started this program for the refugees and what should be done today? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I didn't say that Europe is not a safe place. I, have to, I said that we have to be responsible, join forces and show the European citizens that we take their safety and security very seriously. Uh, I don't know why my uh, Social Democrat colleague raises the issue of refugees because we are talking about terrorism and the two issues should remain distinct. Refugees are not terrorists. Many of them are actually victims of terrorism. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a lot of people for Catch the Eye, but I only take one per group. We're already quite behind. And only those who are actually uh, present in the debate. So, Mr. Chabat Sogov, first. Thank you. Az elmúlt időszak eseményei nyilvánvalóvá tették, hogy a terrorizmus is áll. I think these events have shown us that we are facing a new form of terror now. Terrorism has changed. We need to respond more uh, rapidly. And if the EU can't provide an institutional response, then the member states will have to do that. The protection of our citizens is the highest priority. Terrorist organizations see Europe as a battlefield. We should not allow European citizens to be uh, used uh, as pawns in wars uh, that are going on in uh, Syria and have these fighters come back to Syria without any types of obstacles. They're following their jihadist uh, objectives. They're traveling to other countries. And there's a risk when they come back. Mr. Pasco next. One minute. Thank you. <clears throat> it is a sad truth that names of traffic offenders travel quickly over the member states' borders, while the names of the terrorists do not. The reason is that intelligence cooperation, like security, defense, and foreign policy, is the embodiment of sovereignty, the supreme limit for integration. Ultimately, the response to all terrorist attacks is the responsibility of the hit member state. It is for that member state to react first, but equally it is for the EU to help both in dealing with the consequences, including the apprehension of the perpetrators, and more importantly, in preventing such attacks. After all, as the recent economic and financial crisis forced us to leave sovereignty aside and start interact with Brussels in adopting our national budgets, we should realize that we should do the same in case of intelligence cooperation. Because simply in such cases, the jealousy we demonstrate in defending our national attributes does not save lives. Quite the contrary. Thank you. Thank you, sir. The next Thank you. Uh, we have uh, Mrs. Paga Uzendua Ruiz next. Thank you. Our countries and the EU institutions are stronger than any terrorist organization. If we're united in combating jihadism, then we can achieve it. We need to overcome party political differences, and the EPP have been adopting an anti ALDI tone here. They have the greatest responsibility. We need consensus. And I know about terrorism. Many of my friends and uh, my brother have been killed by terrorists. They tried to kill me too. What we need is a sense of responsibility, justice, and we will be able to win if we understand the hierarchy of problems, prioritize, and not get distracted by sideshows in this chamber. We need to work together in a globalized world. We should have a directive and an office to help the victims of terrorism and we should have a European intelligence agency. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Our condolences on the recent attacks, but we don't want empty condemnations. We want effective tools to be used within the rule of law, not a unilateral military response and cutting away people's freedoms. That's a triumph of terrorism and that is not effective. We've seen the problems with intelligence. We need to uh, tax financing, tax havens, the oil money. We need to stop uh, tolerating our so-called allies when it comes to terrorism and when it comes to arms embargoes as well. It's uh, uh, terrible to hear the uh, EPP uh, accuse a uh, member of supporting terrorism because they want more information on uh, PNR. We are hearing these accusations uh, to uh, the left. These are the ones that destroyed secular societies that are a bar barrier to terrorism or those who are financing Wahhabism. And this is really a joke. We should uh, not have these political games here. Mr. Obermeier, next for one minute. Thank you. It is interesting that the failings of the Belgian authorities uh, and of politics have not been seen to bring about consequences, not been re re resignations of ministers. And one of the things that is surprising is the, Bruce, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, with lobbyists uh, action. Uh, instead of the collection of all possible information on passenger name records, uh, uh, screening and looking at common features of uh, terrorists, we're not doing that. You have a record of gender in PNR without uh, a recording, for example, previous crimes and uh, we need to put this at the center of our uh, efforts. So the, last so the last speaker, Diane Dodds, one minute. Thank you, uh, Madam President. On behalf of the people of Northern Ireland, I want to use this opportunity to condemn the terrorist attacks in Brussels. These barbarous attacks were shocking and brutal, and Northern Ireland stands with you in solidarity and determination to defeat terrorism in all its forms. Sadly, on the same day as the Brussels attack, the community in Northern Ireland was burying one of its own. Prison officer Adrian Ismay was injured and later died when a bomb was planted under his vehicle outside his own home. He was killed by Republican terrorists who have nothing to offer our community but death and tears. I am sure that this House would want to place on record our sympathy to his family and colleagues and reiterate that we stand together in the defeat of terrorism, whether that be in Brussels, Paris, Madrid or Belfast. Having listened to this debate today, I would suggest that this will not be done by creating more European agencies, but that by the proper collaboration of nation states taking responsibility for the lives and well-being of their citizens. Thank you. So, nun ist uh, im Namen der Kommission noch einmal Kommission. Now we have Commissioner Avramopoulos next to speak on behalf of the Commission. Thank you, Lord, Madam Chair. Uh, Honourable members of the Parliament, as you all stress tonight, the Brussels attacks illustrated once again the severity of the challenges we are confronted with. Terrorism claimed over than 180 lives since January 2015 in Europe and many more seriously injured, many more lives changed forever. You know, because I said it many times before, but if we don't put aside the national silo mentality, terrorists will strike again. This is about information sharing, trust, joining forces, working beyond our borders, giving our experts to Europol's counter-terrorism center. That is the only way to respond to the threat together. We all need to live up to our responsibilities, all of us, the Commission, 
the Member States and this Parliament. There is no time and space for blame games. The priorities and gaps have been identified. Now is more than ever time for joint work to deliver actions. And this can only happen by cooperating to the maximum while respecting the principles of our democratic societies. That's why I welcome the finalization of the data protection package to be voted by this House this week. This is an important step which will help us to develop our future tools on the exchange of information. You will also vote to adopt the PNR Directive. The PNR framework is one of the tools that can substantially contribute to our security. I will continue pushing Member States to implement quickly and not wait for two more years. I want to assure you that the Commission stands ready to support Member States to ensure a uniform understanding and implementation, as the Commission also supports interconnected national passengers information units through pilot projects. Your wide support on PNR, therefore, on Thursday will send a strong signal on the role and contribution of this House to security policies. I count on all of you. We made altogether some progress in recent months that has to be acknowledged. More information is being shared between Member States, but still not consistently or comprehensively enough. More alerts are created in the Schengen Information System, which is proven to be one of the most valuable tools to enhance security. The European Counter-Terrorism Centre with Europol is operational, and we still expect all Member States to send their experts and use to its full potential this nervous centre of our op operations. Mr. Verhofstadt, I share some of your views and took note of your suggestions. We have to reach the point that Member States exchange intelligence information in future. Europol has a very specific mission by the treaties, but as President Weber reminded, an important one, to support and strengthen action by the Member States, police authorities and other law enforcement services and their mutual cooperation. Both Europol and Frontex are already supporting Member States to better protect our external borders. We are working with countries such as Turkey, Tunisia, Lebanon, Jordan and the Western Balkans against terrorism. I was in Turkey last week with Europol's director in order to accelerate our effective cooperation. We need Turkey, as we need other key countries in the region that can share information with us on radicalized persons or on persons living or returning from ISIS-occupied areas. On April 20th, one year after the presentation of the agenda, the Commission will report formally on the progress made so far on what needs to be accelerated and what more is needed on the road towards a genuine security union, as President Juncker said here today. Over the last five months, we put on the table important legislative proposals on terrorism, firearms, criminal records, borders, information sharing, all of which should still be adopted as a matter of priority. We cannot expect quick results of security if after each attack we proclaim our determination but then water down every good proposal on the table. Now, on information sharing. Here we are finally coming to understand that the less information we share, the less we know and the less we can prevent. Our information landscape for security in the European Union is simply too complex, too fragmented. If our systems do not talk to each other, if they are not connected, we will continue putting data in black boxes. Data must be interconnected to be useful. Many EU institutions on information sharing are still underused. We, don't, we do not need to reinvent the wheel. We have to start using it more. Last but very important, a word also on radicalization, which is key, as President Pitella stressed. Last week, I was at the UN conference in Geneva. We cannot close our eyes to the fact that again the terrorists were young persons born and raised in the European Union. These are our youngsters. The roots of radicalization are 
complex and multifaceted. There is no button that we can press to solve it. That's why we must rethink our integration and inclusion efforts, our educational structures, our whole approach to promoting tolerance and common values. Honourable members, let us not repeat ourselves. Let us avoid empty words. Our challenges are considerable and they are shared. Let us prove our unity and resilience with concrete actions. Thank you. Thank you very much. To conclude the debate, Mrs. Hennis Plashatna. Thank you, Mr. President. Now, with the members of this House, I share the indignation about the attacks that have taken place. I equally share the sense of urgency to act after Charlie Hebdo, after the Bataclan, and after Zaventem and Malbec. It is our collective responsibility to act, and I am grateful to note that most who contributed to this debate are genuinely seeking solutions. Most are trying to understand what are the causes of senseless violence and terror and how to fight it and how to prevent it. But let me be clear, giving in on our freedom, freedoms is not the way forward. Closing our internal borders is not the solution. This is not about political correctness. This is about our way of living, our values. Several concrete questions were put to me as representative of the Presidency of the Council. For example, the pleas for more exchanging and sharing of intelligence and information. Now, within this context, it was Mr. Verhofstadt who asked me specifically about Europol. And yes, certainly we need to ensure better quality and quantity information in common databases, as well as consistent use and interoperability of databases. We need to connect the dots. The Council will specifically address the challenge of improving the interoperability of databases at its meeting on April 21. Also, I would like to draw attention to the joint statement of Ministers for Justice and Home Affairs of March 24 in view of the attacks two days earlier. And we think that the ten points of action in that statement are a comprehensive agenda. As Presidency, we will pursue that with full force. Now about Europol in particular. We fully agree that effective cross-border investigation capacity is of the utmost importance. Collection of information, of course, is prerequisite to connecting and exchanging information. And member states should step up their efforts here using ways agreed upon, such as joint investigation teams. Now, Europol plays an important role in supporting cross-border investigations and should continuously enhance its cap capabilities as the central information broker and as analysis center. Soon the information architecture Siena, which connects Europol with law enforcement authorities in the member states, will be upgraded to confidential level. As a presidency, we are committed to our initiative to overall improve the collection and exchange of information. And yes, in reply to Mr. Verhofstadt, we would very much welcome further discussions with the Parliament on this initiative. Mr. President, to conclude, let me just repeat that I am grateful for Parliament's support and for your contributions. We share the same objectives in our common fight against terrorism, and I am convinced that we must live up to the expectations of our citizens, improve their safety, uphold their values and rights, and in order to do so, we have to join forces. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you very much, Minister. That concludes the debate. We now move on to the next item on the agenda, which is Council and Commission statements on the effectiveness of existing measures against tax evasion and money laundering in light of recent Panama paper revelations. And Minister Hennis Plashat has the floor again. President, honourable members, about the Panama Papers, I would like to start by saying that all this demonstrates yet again the need to continue our fight against tax fraud and money laundering. 
it is too early, unfortunately, to have a full analysis of the Panama Papers, but all of us are, as you are, examining their implications and the responses to be given. National governments have announced investigations. In, that, in discussing what the EU can do, I will distinguish the tax aspects on the one hand and anti-money laundering on the other. Now on tax in particular, action needs to focus on two policy strands. Firstly, access to information and secondly, measures that can be applied to remedy cases of fraud. The Commission Anti-Tax -tax Avoidance Package, presented in January, provides an important basis to implement internationally agreed standards in binding EU law. As regards access to information, internationally agreed standards on transparency and exchange of information have been developed by the OECD. Significant progress has been made in the recent years. However, not all international players have totally committed yet to playing a fair game, and this is clearly the case for Panama. In order to ensure efficient tax transparency, we need everyone on board. And the EU, as a major international player, must speak with one voice to convince its partners on the, in, on the international stage to adopt the standards agreed by the majority. The EU itself is committed to the issue of exchange of information. We have gone even further than the OECD standards, and many consider us as front-runners, which is good news. We have adopted a directive on administrative cooperation that was recently complemented to cover uh, tax rulings exchange and which will soon cover country by country reporting between tax administrations as proposed in the Commission anti-tax avoidance package. The Council has already reached agreement on this country by country reporting and I would very much welcome the European Parliament to adopt its opinion as soon as possible. Clearly we will not stop here. The Commission adopted today a proposal on public country-by-country -country reporting of multinational accounts to increase transparency, and this proposal will obviously receive the full attention of the Council. The Presidency will definitely strive to have swift progress on this proposal. Now, to come back to the revelations, I would like to speak of what we can do beyond increasing exchange of information in order to fight tax fraud and avoidance, as well as money laundering. In January, the Commission issued a communication on an external strategy for effective taxation as part of the anti-tax avoidance package, amongst others proposing a common EU listing process to respond to third countries that refuses to respect tax good governance standards. The Presidency is striving to react swiftly to these proposals, explicitly taking into account the Panama Papers. Also in January, the Commission Anti-Tax Avoidance Package contains a proposal for a directive laying down rules against tax avoidance practices, the Anti-Tax Avoidance Directive, which is currently being examined. Now, some of the rules put forward in the draft directive could be of use, considering that we are also take, talking about abusive forms of legal tax avoidance. So again, the need for a swift agreement on this directive is Stress. The Presidency is striving to reach an agreement on this proposal during this semester and I do hope um, that we can count on you, Parliament, as well. Finally, I would like to draw attention to the ongoing work of the Code of Conduct Group in Business uh, Taxation in fighting harmful tax regimes. The group is committed to promote the adoption of the Code of Conduct principles in third countries. The group has worked successfully in Switzerland and the Commission is continuing its dialogue with Liechtenstein on behalf of the group. And other countries outside the EU should be involved in the near future. Now, Mr. President, let me turn quickly to money laundering. This issue, which is closely linked to the financing of terrorism, is also very high on our agenda. In February, in reaction to the Commission's action plan on the fight against ter terrorist financing, the Council agreed to proceed swiftly with the implementation of a number of measures which will contribute to combating both terrorist financing and money laundering. Let me outline the ones which are particularly relevant in the context of our discussion today. Firstly, ministers emphasize the need for identification of third countries with strategic deficiencies in the area of money laundering or countering terrorist financing. As you are aware, in accordance with the fourth anti anti-money laundering directive, 
Member states should apply enhanced due, dil due, oh my God, due diligence measures on financial flows from and to these listed countries. In February, we called for the identification process to be completed by the 1st of May. Here, however, we are in the hands of the Commission. We know that our sense of urgency is shared by the Commission, who is working hard on this matter, and we do hope that it is also shared by the European Parliament. Secondly, ministers underline the importance of, ex, um, expedite, ex, of speeding up the implementation of the anti-money laundering package, which, which the European Parliament and Council adopted last year. Our shared objective is to aim for completion of this process by the end of this year. Thirdly, we have undertaken to further improve the cooperation and exchange of information between Member States' financial intelligence units. Fourthly, we called on the Commission to propose by June certain targeted improvements to the fourth anti-money laundering directive. Furthermore, we have asked the Commission to explore the possibility to introduce limits to large cash payments and to consider together with the European Central Bank whether appropriate measures might be necessary for high denomination notes such as the 500 euro bill. As you know, the anti-money laundering directive is very recent and is still being transposed by member states. For certain areas, however, it has become clear already now that targeted amendments are needed. For example, aimed at strengthening access to information such as access to bank and payment account information by financial intelligence units, operationalizing the list of high-risk third countries and in view of handling of virtual currencies. The Council is, all, is ready to work on a Commission proposal in this respect as a matter of priority, and I'm sure that this would also be the case for, again, the European Parliament.